Chapter twenty seven, part seven of Volume three of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume three of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter twenty seven. The Wars of Italy. Louis the Twelfth. 1498 to 1515 part 7 the battle took place on the next day but one april 11th the gentle duke of nemours set out pretty early from his quarters armed at all points as he went forth he looked at the sun already risen which was mighty red look my lords how red the sun is he said to the company about him there was a gentleman whom he loved exceedingly a right gentle comrade whose name was hoberdin the witch replied know you pray what that means my lord to-day will die some prince or great captain it must needs be you or the spanish viceroy the duke of nemours burst out a laughing at this speech and went on as far as the bridge to finish the passing in review of his army which was showing marvellous diligence as he was conversing with bayard who had come in search of him they noticed not far from them a troop of twenty or thirty spanish gentlemen all mounted amongst whom was captain pedro de paz leader of all their genetiers, light cavalry, mounted on Spanish horses called genets. The good knight advanced twenty or thirty paces and saluted them, saying, Gentlemen, you are diverting yourselves, as we are, whilst waiting for the regular game to begin. I pray you let there be no firing of arquebuses on your side, and there shall be no firing at you on ours. The courtesy was reciprocated. Sir Bayard, asked Don Pedro de Paz, who is yon lord in such goodly array? and to whom your folks show so much honour. It is our chief, the Duke of Nemours, answered Bayard, nephew of our prince and brother of your queen. Germain de Foy, Gaston de Foy's sister, had married, as his second wife, Ferdinand the Catholic. Hardly had he finished speaking, when Captain Pedro de Paz and all those who were with him dismounted and addressed the noble prince in these words, Sir, save the honour and service due to the king our master, we declare to you that we are, and wish forever to remain your servants. The Duke of Nemours thanked them gallantly for their gallant homage, and after a short, chivalrous exchange of conversation, they went, respectively, to their own posts. The artillery began by causing great havoc on both sides. Odd's body, said a Spanish captain, shut up in a fort which the French were attacking, and which he had been charged to defend. We are being killed here by bolts that fall from heaven. Go we, and fight with men. And he sallied from the fort with all his people, to go and take part in the general battle. Since God created heaven and earth, says the lawyer, Servateur of Bayard, was never seen a more cruel and rough assault than that which the French and Spaniards made upon one another, and for more than a long half-hour lasted this fight. They rested before one another's eyes to recover their breath. Then they let down their visors, and so began all over again, shouting, France! and Spain! the most imperiously in the world. At last the Spaniards were utterly broken, and constrained to abandon their camp, whereon, and between two ditches, died three or four hundred men-at-arms. Every one would fain have set out in pursuit, but the good knight said to the Duke of Nemours, who was all covered with blood and brains from one of his men-at-arms, that had been carried off by a cannonball, "'My lord, are you wounded?' "'No,' said the Duke, "'but I have wounded a many others.' "'Now God be praised,' said Bayard, "'you have gained the battle, and abide this day the most honoured prince in the world. But push not farther forward. Reassemble your men-at-arms in this spot. Let none set on to pillage yet, for it is not time. Captain Louis d'Ar and I are off after these fugitives, that they may not retire behind their foot. But stir not, for any man living from here, unless Captain Louis d'Ar or I come hither to fetch you.' The Duke of Nemours promised, but whilst he was biding on his ground, awaiting Bayard's return, he said to the Baron du Chimay, an honest gentleman who had knowledge, says Fleurange, of things to come, and who, before the battle, had announced to Gaston that he would gain it, but he would be in danger of being left there if God did not do him grace. Well, Sir Doddard, am I left there, as you said? Here I am still. Sir, it is not all over yet, answered Chimay, whereupon there arrived an archer, who came and said to the duke, My lord, yonder be two thousand Spaniards, who are going off all orderly along the causeway. Certes, said Gaston, I cannot suffer that. Who loves me, follow me. 
and resuming his arms he pushed forward. "'Wait for your men,' said Sire de Lautrec to him. But Gaston took no heed, and followed by only twenty or thirty men-at-arms, he threw himself upon those retreating troops. He was immediately surrounded, thrown from his horse, and defending himself all the while, like Roland at Roncesvalles, say the chroniclers, he fell pierced with wounds. "'Do not kill him,' shouted Lautrec. "'It is the brother of your queen.' Lautrec himself was so severely handled and wounded that he was thought to be dead. Gaston really was, though the news spread but slowly. Bayard, returning with his comrades from pursuing the fugitives, met on his road the Spanish force that Gaston had so rashly attacked, and that continued to retire in good order. Bayard was all but charging them, when a Spanish captain came out of the ranks and said to him in his own language, "'What would you do, sir? You are not powerful enough to beat us. You have won the battle.' Let the honour thereof suffice you, and let us go with our lives, for by God's will are we escaped. Bayard felt that the Spaniard spoke truly. He had but a handful of men with him, and his own horse could not carry him any longer. The Spaniards opened their ranks, and he passed through the middle of them, and let them go. Las, says his loyal servitor, he knew not that the good Duke of Nemours was dead, or that those yonder were they who had slain him. He had died ten thousand deaths, but he would have avenged him if he had known it. When the fatal news was known, the consternation and grief were profound. At the age of twenty-three, Gaston de Foy had, in less than six months, won the confidence and affection of the army, of the king, and of France. It was one of those sudden and undisputed reputations which seemed to mark out men for the highest destinies. I would fain, said Louis the Twelfth, when he heard of his death, have no longer an inch of land in Italy, and be able at that price to bring back to life my nephew Gaston, and all the gallants who perished with him. God keep us from often gaining such victories. In the Battle of Ravenna, says Guiarcadini, fell at least ten thousand men, a third of them French, and two-thirds their enemies. But in respect of chosen men and men of renown, the loss of the victors was by much the greater, and the loss of Gaston de Foy alone surpassed all the others put together. With him went all the vigor and furious onset of the French army. La Palice, a warrior valiant and honored, assumed the command of this victorious army, but under pressure of repeated attacks from the Spaniards, the Venetians, and the Swiss, he gave up first the Romagna, then Milanese, withdrew from place to place, and ended by falling back on Piedmont. Julius the Second won back all he had won and lost. Maximilian Sforza, son of Ludovic the Moor, after twelve years of exile in Germany, returned to Milan to resume possession of his father's duchy. By the end of June, 1512, less than three months after the victory of Ravenna, the domination of the French had disappeared from Italy. Louis the Twelfth had, indeed, something else to do besides crossing the Alps to go to the protection of such precarious conquests. Into France itself war was about to make its way. It was his own kingdom and his own country that he had to defend. In vain, after the death of Isabella of Castile, had he married his niece, Germaine de Foy, to Ferdinand the Catholic, whilst giving up to him all pretensions to the kingdom of Naples. In 1512 Ferdinand invaded Navarre, took possession of the Spanish portion of that little kingdom, and thence threatened Gascony. Henry the Eighth, King of England, sent him a fleet, which did not withdraw until after it had appeared before Bayonne, and thrown the southwest of France into a state of alarm. In the north, Henry the Eighth continued his preparations for an expedition into France, obtained from his Parliament subsidies for that purpose, and concerted plans with Emperor Maximilian, who renounced his doubtful neutrality and engaged himself at last in the Holy League. Louis the Twelfth had in Germany an enemy as zealous almost as Julius the Second was in Italy. Maximilian's daughter, Princess Marguerite of Austria, had never forgiven France or its king, whether he were called Charles the Eighth or Louis the Twelfth, the treatment she had received from that court, when, after having been kept there and brought up for eight years to become Queen of France, she had been sent away and handed back to her father, to make way for Anne of Brittany. She was now ruler of the Low Countries, active, able, and full of passion, and in continual correspondence with her father, the Emperor, over whom she exercised a great deal of influence. This correspondence was published in 1839, by the Société de l'Histoire de France, in two volumes, from the originals, which exist in the archives of Lille. The Swiss, on their side, continuing to smart under the contemptuous language which Louis had imprudently applied to them, became more and more pronounced against him. 
rudely dismissed Louis de la Tramoy, who attempted to negotiate with them, re-established Maximilian Sforza in the Duchy of Milan, and haughtily styled themselves vanquishers of kings and defenders of the Holy Roman Church. And the Roman Church made a good defender of herself. Louis the Second had convoked at Rome, at St. John Lateran, a council which met on the 3rd of May, 1512, and in presence of which the Council of Pisa and Milan, after an attempt at removing to Lyon, vanished away like a phantom. Everywhere things were turning out according to the wishes and for the profit of the Pope, and France and her king were reduced to defending themselves on their own soil against a coalition of all their great neighbors. Man proposes and God disposes. Not a step can be made in history without meeting some corroboration of that modest, pious, grand truth. On the 21st of February, 1513, ten months since Gaston de Foy, the victor of Ravenna, had perished in the hour of his victory, Pope Julius II died at Rome at the very moment when he seemed invited to enjoy all the triumph of his policy. He died without bluster and without disquietude, disavowing naught of his past life, and relinquishing none of his designs as to the future. He had been impassioned and skilful in the employment of moral force, whereby alone he could become master of material forces, a rare order of genius, and one which never lacks grandeur, even when the man who possesses it abuses it. His constant thought was how he might free Italy from the barbarians, and he liked to hear himself called by the name of liberator, which was commonly given him. One day the outspoken Cardinal Grimani said to him that nevertheless the kingdom of Naples, one of the greatest and richest portions of Italy, was still under the foreign yoke, whereupon Julius the Second, brandishing the staff on which he was leaning, said, wrathfully, Assuredly, if heaven had not otherwise ordained, the Neapolitans too would have shaken off the yoke which lies heavy on them. Giardini has summed up, with equal justice and sound judgment, the principal traits of his character. He was a prince, says the historian, of incalculable courage and firmness, full of boundless imaginings which would have brought him headlong to ruin if the respect borne to the church, the dissensions of princes and the conditions of the times, far more than his own moderation and prudence, had not supported him. He would have been worthy of higher glory had he been a laic prince, or had it been, in order to elevate the church in spiritual rank, and by processes of peace, that he put in practice the diligence and zeal he displayed for the purpose of augmenting his temporal greatness by the arts of war. Nevertheless he has left, above all his predecessors, a memory full of fame and honor, especially amongst those men who can no longer call things by their right names, or appreciate them at their true value, and who think that it is the duty of the sovereign pontiffs to extend, by means of arms and the blood of Christians, the power of the Holy See, rather than to wear themselves out in setting good examples of a Christian's life, and in reforming manners and customs pernicious to the salvation of souls, that aim of aims for which they assert that Christ has appointed them his vicars on earth. The death of Julius the Second seemed to Louis the Twelfth a favourable opportunity for once more setting foot in Italy, and recovering at least that which he regarded as his hereditary right, the Duchy of Milan. He commissioned Louis de la Tremoille to go and renew the conquest, and whilst thus reopening the Italian war, he commenced negotiations with certain of the coalitionists of the Holy League, in the hope of causing division amongst them, or even of attracting some one of them to himself. He knew that the Venetians were dissatisfied and disquieted about their allies, especially Emperor Maximilian, the new Duke of Milan, Maximilian Sforza, and the Swiss. He had little difficulty in coming to an understanding with the Venetian Senate, and on the 14th of May, 1513, a treaty of alliance, offensive and defensive, was signed at Blois between the King of France and the Republic of Venice. Louis hoped also to find at Rome in the new Pope, Leo X, Cardinal John de' Medici, elected Pope March 11, 1513, favorable inclinations, but they were at first very ambiguously and reservedly manifested. As a Florentine, Leo X had a leaning towards France, but as Pope, he was not disposed to relinquish or disavow the policy of Julius II, as to the independence of Italy in respect of any foreign sovereign, and as to the extension of the power of the Holy See, and he wanted time to make up his mind to infuse into his relations with Louis XII good will instead of his predecessor's impassioned hostility. 
Louis had not, and could not have, any confidence in Ferdinand the Catholic, but he knew him to be as prudent as he was rascally, and he concluded with him at Orthez, on the 1st of April, 1513, a year's truce, which Ferdinand took great care not to make known to his allies, Henry the Eighth, King of England, and the Emperor Maximilian, the former of whom was very hot-tempered, and the latter very deeply involved, through his daughter Margaret of Austria, in the warlike league against France. Madame, the name given to Marguerite as ruler of the Low Countries, wrote the Florentine minister to Lorenzo de' Medici, asks for naught but war against the most Christian king. She thinks of naught but keeping up and fanning the kindled fire, and she has all the game in her hands, for the king of England and the emperor have full confidence in her, and she does with them just as she pleases. This was all that was gained during the year of Julius the Second's death by Louis the Twelfth's attempts to break up or weaken the coalition against France, and these feeble diplomatic advances were soon nullified by the unsuccess of the French expedition in Milanese. Louis de la Tremoille had once more entered it with a strong army, but he was on bad terms with his principal lieutenant, John James Trivulzio, over whom he had not the authority wielded by the young and brilliant Gaston de Foy. The French were close to Navarra, the siege of which they were about to commence. They heard that a body of Swiss was advancing to enter the place. La Tremoille shifted his position to oppose them, and on the 5th of June, 1513, he told all his captains in the evening that they might go to their sleeping quarters and make good cheer, for the Swiss were not yet ready to fight, not having all their men assembled but early next morning the Swiss attacked the French camp. La Tremoille had hardly time to rise, and with half his armor on, mount his horse. The Swiss outposts and those of the French were already at work pell-mell over against his quarters. The battle was hot and bravely contested on both sides, but the Swiss, by a vigorous effort, got possession of the French artillery, and turned it against the infantry of the Lansconex, which was driven in and broken. The French army abandoned the siege of Novora, and put itself in retreat, first of all on Versailles, a town of Piedmont, and then on France itself. And I do assure you, says Fleurange, an eye-witness and partaker in the battle, that there was great need of it. The men-at-arms there were but few lost, or of the French foot, which turned out a marvellous good thing for the king and the kingdom, for they found him very much embroiled with the English and other nations. War between France and England had recommenced at sea in 1512, two squadrons, one French of twenty sail, and the other English, of more than forty, met on the 10th of August somewhere off the coast of Ishant. A brave Breton, Admiral Hervé Primojouet, aboard of the great ship of the Queen of France, named the Cordeliere, commanded the French squadron, and Sir Thomas Knevet, a young sailor of more bravery than experience, according to the historians of his own country, commanded, on board of a vessel named the Regent, the English squadron. The admiral's vessels engaged in a deadly duel, but the French admiral, finding himself surrounded by superior forces, threw his grappling irons on to the English vessel, and rather than surrender, set fire to the two admiral's ships, which blew up at the same time, together with their crews of two thousand men. The sight of heroism and death has a powerful effect upon men, and sometimes suspends their quarrels. The English squadron went out again to sea, and the French went back to Brest. Next year the struggle recommenced, but on land, and with nothing so striking. An English army started from Calais, and went and blockaded, on the 17th of June, 1513, the fortress of Therouanne in Artois. It was a fortnight afterwards before Henry the Eighth himself quitted Calais, where festivities and tournaments had detained him too long for what he had in mind, and set out on the march with twelve thousand foot to go and join his army before Therouanne. He met on his road, near Thornham, a body of twelve hundred French men-at-arms, with their followers a horseback, and in the midst of them Bayard. Sire de Pienne, governor of Picardy, was in command of them. "'My lord,' said Bayard to him, "'let us charge them. No harm can come of it to us, or very little. If at the first charge we make an opening in them, they are broken. If they repulse us, we shall still get away. They are on foot, and we a horseback.' and nearly all the French were of his opinion, continues the chronicler, but Sire de Pienne said, Gentlemen, I have orders, on my life from the king our master, to risk nothing, but only hold this country. Do as you please, for my part I shall not consent thereto. Thus was the matter stayed, 
and the King of England passed with his band under the noses of the French. Henry the Eighth arrived quietly with his army before Therouin, the garrison of which defended itself valiantly, though short of provisions. Louis the Twelfth sent orders to Sire de Pienne to revictual Therouin at any price. The French men-at-arms, to the number of fourteen hundred lances, at whose head marched La Palice, Bayard, the Duke of Longueville, grandson of the great Dunois, and Sire de Pienne himself, set out on the 16th of August to go and make, from the direction of Gingate, a sham attack upon the English camp, whilst eight hundred Albanian light cavalry were to burst, from another direction, upon the enemy's lines, cut their way through at a gallop, penetrate to the very fosses of the fortress, and throw into them munitions of war and of the stomach, hung to their horses' necks. The Albanians carried out their orders successfully. The French men-at-arms, after having skirmished for some time with the cavalry of Henry the Eighth and Maximilian, began to fall back a little carelessly and in some disorder towards their own camp, when they perceived two large masses of infantry and artillery, English and German, preparing to cut off their retreat. Surprise led to confusion. The confusion took the form of panic. The French men-at-arms broke into a gallop, and dispersing in all directions, thought of nothing but regaining the main body and the camp at Blangy. This sudden rout of so many gallants received the sorry name of the affair of spurs, for spurs did more service than the sword. Many a chosen captain, the Duc de Longueville, Sire de la Palice, and Bayard, whilst trying to rally the fugitives, were taken by the enemy. Emperor Maximilian, who had arrived at the English camp three or four days before the affair, was of opinion that the Allies should march straight upon the French camp, to take advantage of the panic and disorder. But Henry the Eighth and his lords did not agree with him. They contented themselves with pressing on the siege of Therouin, which capitulated on the 22nd of August, for want of provisions. The garrison was allowed to go free, the men-at-arms with lance on thigh and the foot with pike on shoulder, with their harness and all that they could carry. But in spite of an article in the capitulation, the town was completely dismantled and burnt, and by the advice of Emperor Maximilian, Henry the Eighth made all haste to go and lay siege to Tournay, a French fortress between Flanders and Hainault, the capture of which was of great importance to the Low Countries and to Marguerite of Austria, their ruler. End of chapter 27, part 7